Hi guys, it's me, Professor D, and welcome back to my channel. On this video, I'm going to be covering, cover, covering maternity. I've gotten so many comments, so many students that are saying, Professor D, please, we need more maternity. So that's what I'm going to cover today. If you haven't done so already, please do not forget to like and subscribe below. You subscribing, you liking those videos, that's what keeps that content coming and lets me know you like what you're seeing. So guys, let's just jump right into it. The first question, a 25 year old client has a goiter, excuse me, a 25 year old client with a goiter is admitted to the unit. What, what would the nurse expect the admitting assessment to reveal? A, a slow pulse, B, anorexia, C, bulging eyes, or D, weight gain. If you're new to my channel, guys, I know I go kind of fast. So all you have to do is go ahead and pause. After I go over the questions and the choices, just press pause if you need a little bit of time to think of your answer, okay? So the correct answer for this question is the bulging eyes. Why? Because patients with um, hyperthyroidism, okay, we expect them to possibly have what? exophthalmos that's the bulging eyes what else do we expect for them to see we expect for them to see um we expect to see them have weight loss right because what happens is when a patient has hyperthyroidism they have an increased metabolism they're burning so many calories so you're going to see increased weight loss you're going to see hypertension because everything's going through the roof their blood pressure is going through the roof you're going to see tachycardia why the heart rate is going even their brain function cognition it's going 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 so that kind of person is going to talk you to death right because everything is increased in their body so the correct answer for this is c and uh, bulging eyes other choices a slow pulse absolutely not that's going to be a patient that has hypo thyroidism because when you have hypo thyroidism everything is down okay anorexia Anorexia is when the patient doesn't want to eat. That's not this case. Patient with hyperthyroidism, they want to eat. They have no problem with um, their appetite. The problem is they just burn the calories very quickly. And choice D, weight gain. Also, that's a patient that has hypothyroidism. Okay. Next question. Which of the following foods, if selected by the mother with a child with celiac, would indicate her understanding of dietary instructions? A, whole wheat uh, toast, B, angel hair, C, Reuben on rye, or D, rice cereal? And the correct answer is D, rice cereal. Why? Patients that have celiac disease are not able to digest foods that have wheat, barley, rye, oats, okay? So that's why we can't choose choice A, B, or C. So the only thing on this list that, that patient would be able to have is rice, okay? Because rice does not have that wheat, barley, oh, right, um, wheat, barley, uh, wheat, barley, and oats. Next question. Which observation would the nurse expect to make after an amniotomy? A, dark yellow amniotic fluid. B, clear amniotic fluid. C, greenish amniotic fluid or D, red amniotic fluid? And I'll give you a moment to think of your answer. And the correct answer is B, clear amniotic fluid. Now here's the thing, guys. Amniotic fluid is supposed to be clear, straw colored. It should not have any odor, okay? This is the fluid that is in the amniotic sac. It should not have any color. So let's look at our other choices. Let me go over the wrong answer so I can explain to you why they're wrong. You have a dark yellow amniotic fluid. You know what that dark yellow means? Infection. Okay. That dark yellow means purulent. So that's bad. We don't want that. You have choice C, green amniotic fluid. When it's green, you know what that tells you? That's probably meconium stain. Remember meconium, that's the, the baby's first stool that should happen after the baby's born. So if the baby has their first stool inside um, the womb, that's a problem because guess what? That fetus might, what? They might um, breathe in that amniotic fluid and aspirate. Okay, so that's not good. And then we have D, red amniotic fluid. Come on, guys. When you see red, what does that mean? Hemorrhage. 
Mom is bleeding. That's the problem. So the only thing that's normal that we want to see is clear. You want it to be clear. You want it to have no odor. Okay. Next question. The OB client's fetal heart rate is 80 to 90 during contractions. The first action the nurse should take is A, reposition the monitor, B, turn the client to her left side, C, ask the client to ambulate, or D, prepare the client for delivery. And I'll give you a moment to think of your answer. So the correct answer, guys, is B, turn the client to her left side. Why? Look at the fetal heart rate, 80 to 90. The fetal heart rate is supposed to be 120 to 60, okay? If that fetal heart rate is 80 to 90, that's the problem. What does that mean? That means that the fetus's heart is not pushing out enough what? Blood oxygen, vitamins, nutrients, everything that that fetus needs to survive, okay? The heart rate is supposed to be 120 to 160. So what are you gonna do? You're gonna place the mom to her left side. Why? When you put mom on her left side, that increases oxygenation to the fetus, okay? You see choice A, reposition the monitor. Look how they try to trick you. They said reposition, and if you don't look at the whole thing, as a student, you're gonna choose it and get it wrong right? Reposition, yes, but look what it says, reposition the monitor. What's that going to do for the baby? Absolutely nothing, so it's wrong. Choice C, ask the mom to ambulate. Are you crazy? That heart rate's 80 to 90. You better not. What you're going to do is place mom on the left side to increase oxygen to the fetus, okay? Because what happens if you make mom ambulate? You make mom ambulate. She's walking. She's walking. What, does, what happens when she's walking? Her body has the increased demand for oxygen. You're gonna make it worse for the baby. So absolutely not. And then you have choice T, uh, D, prepare for delivery. No. You're gonna place mom on the left side, it's gonna increase oxygen um, to the fetus, and what we expect to see is that heart rate go up to the 120 to 160 that we wanna see. Next question. As the client reaches six centimeters dilation, the nurse notes late deceleration on the fetal monitor. What is the most likely explanation of this pattern? A, the baby's sleeping. B, the umbilical cord is compressed. C, there's head compression. Or D, there's utero-placental insufficiency. And the answer is D, there's urto-placental insufficiency. Late deceleration. What does that mean, late deceleration? So what happens is, for example, when mom starts to have contraction or maybe she's moving, there's, a, there's something going on in the body, right? What we expect to see is the baby's heart rate go up and then go back to baseline, all right? But when we see a late decelerations, what's happening? It's not going up right when that movement's happening. That's a problem. What does that tell us? That tells us that when mom's ready for true labor, right? The baby's body's not going to react the way it's supposed to. The baby's not going to be getting what? Enough oxygen. And that's what's happening here. When we see late decelerations, that tells us that there is not enough oxygen going from mom to the baby. And that's a problem because when mom goes into labor, this is something very traumatic to the baby and the baby's going to need lots of oxygen, right? We're going to need to see that baby's heart rate go up because remember, it's the heart rate. It's the heart that's beating and bringing oxygen, vitamins, nutrients, everything that that baby needs to survive to the body. Okay, so when you see late decelerations, number one, that's bad. And number two, that tells us that baby's not getting enough oxygen. Okay, next question. The nurse notes a variable decelerations on the fetal monitor strip. The most appropriate initial action would be to A, notify the doctor, B, start an IV, C, reposition the client, or D, readjust the monitor. And I'll give you a moment to think of your answer. Now, this is another one that they tried to trick you again. The correct answer is C, reposition the client. Let me take it a step further. Not only do you want to reposition the client, you want to put them on their left side. Remember I told you, when you put mommy on her left side, that increases oxygen. It increases blood supply 
to the fetus. Now look how they try to trick you. If you look at D, it says readjust, but what does it say? The monitor. How is readjusting the monitor gonna help the baby? Okay, let me tell you something. It's always going to be patient before machine. You're gonna do something for the patient, okay? So, and that's what you're gonna do. You're gonna reposition patient. Look at the other choices. A, notify the doctor. Are you crazy? So let me get this right. You're seeing variable deceleration. You didn't do anything to help mommy, but you're calling the doctor to tell what? What are you gonna tell the doctor? While that baby's in trouble. The first thing you're gonna do is reposition the client because many times when you reposition the client and you put her on her left side, that's enough. The minute you put her on her left side, more blood flow and oxygen goes to the baby and you solve the problem. So the first thing you're gonna do is put her on the left side. Then if you put her on the left side and you see that's not working, you can give mom oxygen because there's, there's always things that you can do before you call the doctor. Whenever you guys are looking at these choices, you have to say to yourself, before you choose that answer of call the doctor, is there anything else I can do on, the, on this list before I turn my back to the patient and call the doctor? Because when you're calling the doctor and you're telling the doctor one of the, what's going on with the patient, one of the things you have to tell the doctor is what you've already done to try to fix the problem. So you have to say to yourself, before I call the doctor, is there anything on this list that I can do to help the patient before I turn my back on them to go call the doctor, okay? So you're gonna reposition the patient on their left side. Number one, after you put them on their left side, you're gonna do what? What did I tell you to do? Give them oxygen. Left side, oxygen, then you could call the doctor if that doesn't work. Okay, but you're always going to reposition the patient. Try to do something to help the baby. Try to help do something to help the mommy before you go ahead and call the doctor. Next question. The rationale for inserting a French catheter every hour for the client with the epidural anesthesia is A, the bladder fills more rapidly because of medication used for epidural. B, her level of consciousness is such that she's in a trance-like state. C, the sensation of the bladder filling is diminished or lost. Or D, she's embarrassed to ask for the bedpan that frequently. And I'll give you a moment to think of your answer. And the correct answer is C, the sensation of the bladder filling is diminished or lost. What happens is the anesthesia decreases mom's urge to void. Okay, so it's not that the bladder stops filling. No, the kidneys are working, the bladder's filling, but she can't feel it. So what happens if your bladder keeps getting full? It's getting full, it's getting full, it's getting full, it's getting full, and you don't urinate. What's, what, what could possibly happen? Rupture. Okay, With, and that within itself is a medical emergency. That patient will have to go into the OR immediately. So that's why you go ahead and put that catheter in because mom's not going to be able to feel that urge to void and you need to get that urine out of the bladder. So that is the correct answer. Next question. A client with diabetes asked the nurse for advice regarding methods of birth control. Which method of birth control is most suitable for the client with diabetes? A, intrauterine device. B, oral contraceptives. D, C, diagram, diaphragm. Or D, contraceptive sponge. The correct answer is C, diaphragm. Why do you think in this question they told you that the patient was diabetic? They could have just said, oh, a woman came in, she wants to know what's the best contraception, but they told you she was diabetic for a reason, guys. What do we know about diabetes? We know diabetes increases your blood sugar. We know that diabetes decreases your um, nerve sensation, right? Causes paresthesia, yes. I can never pronounce that word, but you guys know what I'm saying, paresthesiasis. And what else do we know about diabetes? It's full of sugar. Sugar attracts what? Bacteria, right? Bacteria loves the sugary environment. That's why patients with diabetes are very, very, very high risk for infections, guys. So let, let's look at this list. 
a intrauterine device. If you guys, I don't remember which video I did that I talked to you about this, but anything that's foreign, anything that goes into the body is high risk for infection. Why? The, the bacteria loves to just go to anything that is foreign to the body and they'll sit there and clump there. Okay. So an IUD is not a good thing for a patient with diabetes because a patient with diabetes is already at risk for infection. Why would you give them a foreign device to put the, in their body that would increase the risk for them to get infection even more? Choice B, oral contraceptives. What do we know about oral contraceptives? They increase your blood sugar. This patient already has diabetes. Do they need anything to increase their blood sugar? Absolutely not. So we're not going to tell them to get oral um, contraceptives. What about choice D, a contraceptive sponge? Same thing. That is something that's foreign in the body. It places the patient at risk for infection. So we're not going to tell them to put in that sponge. So the only good choice out of that is that diaphragm. They use that diaphragm and it comes out. Okay. Next question. The doctor suspects that the client has an ectopic pregnancy, which says, which says, I can't speak today, guys. Forgive me. Oh, by the way, guys, I know you don't care, but by the way, I'm on vacation. Today's my birthday. I'm on vacation. I'm living my best life. So my brain kind of isn't here. So be patient with me. I'm going to go back over these questions and the choices. So the doctor suspects that the client has an ectopic pregnancy, which system is consistent with a diagnosis of ruptured ectopic pregnancy, a painless vaginal bleeding, B abdominal cramping, C throbbing pain in the upper quadrant or D sudden stabbing pain in the lower quadrant. And the correct answer is D, sudden stabbing pain in the lower quadrant. So guys, the ectopic pregnancy is a pregnancy where that baby's anywhere but in the womb where they're supposed to be, right? So ectopic pregnancy, that baby's where? In the fallopian tubes? Where's that fallopian tube? Where are they located? In the lower quadrant. And let me tell you, that pain is so severe, mom won't even be able to move. Okay. It's not a pain like, Oh, you know, I think something's wrong. No, it's a very sharp, severe stabbing pain. It feels like somebody just took a knife and they're just stabbing them in their lower quadrant. Okay. Look at our other choices. Cause I want you to understand why the correct answer is the correct, but why the wrong answers are wrong. You have a painless vaginal bleeding. Mm -mm. When you hear painless vaginal bleeding, I want your brain to go to placenta previa. Placenta previa, that's when the patient has bleeding, but it's painless. Okay? If the patient has bleeding, but it's painful, that's abruptio placenta. You have to know the difference between the two. Okay? B, abdominal cramping. When the patient has abdominal cramping, that usually means that the patient's in labor. C, look at, look at what they did to you in C, guys throbbing in the upper quadrant, the upper quadrant. They didn't even say left upper quadrant, right upper quadrant, center, just upper quadrant. Come on. No. Ectopic pregnancy. You're going, um, they're going to feel the pain and it's going to be stabbing in the lower quadrant. And I'm telling you guys, mom will say it feels like someone's just stabbing her in the lower quadrant. You're going to tell mom to come to the ER immediately and you're going to suspect an ectopic pregnancy. A client tells the doctor that she's about 20 weeks pregnant. The most definitive sign of pregnancy is A, elevated HCG, B, the presence of fetal heart tones, C, uterine enlargement, or D, positive enlargement, excuse me, breast enlargement and tenderness. The correct answer is B, the presence of fetal heart tone. So let me explain this to you guys. The only definitive, the only positive, the only 100% yes way that we know mom is pregnant is we either see the baby on ultrasound, right? Visualization. You see the baby on ultrasound or you can hear the baby's heartbeat. Everything else is subjective. Oh, their breasts got bigger. 
maybe they're pregnant, but it could be something else. Maybe they just gained weight. Oh, they have, what's our other choices? Uh, they have um, elevated HCG. Elevated HCG, that's a probable sign of pregnancy, but not positive, okay? Because her hormones could be off, right? And it may be high and she's not pregnant, okay? So let me make this clear. 100% only two ways. You can see that baby on the ultrasound or you can hear that baby's heartbeat. That's it. Everything else is either probable, they're subjective, okay? Next question. Which of the following instructions should be included in the, teach, in the nurse's teaching regarding oral contraceptives? A, weight gain should be reported to the physician. B, an alternate method of birth control is needed when taking antibiotics. C, if the client misses one or more pills, two pills should be taken per day for one week. Or D, changes in the menstrual flow should be reported to the physician. Now I'll give you a moment to think of your answer. And the correct answer, the correct answer, guys, is B, okay? Whenever a woman's taking um, oral contraceptives, if she's taking antibiotics for that time frame, let's say she's taking antibiotics for seven days, for that time frame that she's taking antibiotics, she has to either have her partner use a condom or she has to use an alternate form of contraception. Why? Antibiotics decrease the effectiveness of oral contraceptives. So guess what? The woman is taking oral contraceptives and she's taking antibiotics, she can get pregnant. Why? Because the, the oral contraceptives will not be effective the way they're supposed to because of the antibiotics. So you have to teach them for that time frame, they need to use the alternate uh, method of birth control besides the oral um, contraceptives, okay? The nurse is discussing breastfeeding with a postpartum client. Breastfeeding is contraindicated in the postpartum client with A, diabetes, B, HIV, C, hypertension, or D, thyroid disease. And I'll give you a moment to think of your answer. The correct answer is B, HIV. If mom is HIV positive, it's 100% contraindicated. She cannot breastfeed. All of the other choices you can breastfeed, but um, HIV, 100% contraindicated. That baby's gonna have to receive formula. She cannot uh, breastfeed the baby. Next question. A client's admitted to the labor and delivery unit complaining of vaginal bleeding with very little discomfort. The nurse's first action should be a, assess the fetal heart tones. B, check for cervical dilation. C, check firmness of the uterus. Or D, obtain a detailed history. And I'll give you a moment to think of your answer. Guys, remember what I told you. You're always going to check your patient. You're always going to assess. So this question saying that mom says she's bleeding it doesn't hurt a lot, but she's, she's bleeding. What did I tell you pain is bleeding your brain's supposed to go to? Placenta previa, that's what you're supposed to suspect. What's the first thing you're gonna do? Hey, check the fetal heart tones. Pain is bleeding, I want your brain to go to placenta previa. Painful bleeding, I want your brain to go to abruptio placentae, okay? Next question. A client telephones the emergency room stating that she thinks she's in labor. The nurse should tell the client that labor has probably begun when A, her contractions are two minutes apart, B, she has back pain and bloody discharge, C, she experiences abdominal pain and frequent urination, or D, her contractions are five minutes apart. Now, this question is straight to the point. It's not any critical thinking. It's just a fact. What's the answer? The answer is D. She's probably in labor when she, her contractions are five minutes apart. That's what you're going to teach her. The nurse is teaching a group of prenatal clients about the effects of cigarette smoke on fetal development. Which characteristic is associated with babies born to mothers who smoke during pregnancy? A, low birth weight. B, large for gestational age. 
C, preterm birth, but appropriate size for gestation. D, growth retardation in weight and length. And I'll give you a moment to think of your answer. The correct answer is A, low birth weight. Moms who smoke across the board, study after study after study after study, as shown, moms who smoke, they tend to have babies with low birth weight. Now let's look at our other choices. B, large for gestational age. Those are diabetic moms. Moms who are diabetic, when they have babies, the babies tend to be large for gestational age, not smokers. Look at C, preterm birth. That's correct. Women who smoke tend to have babies preterm, yes. But look at the rest of the answer. But appropriate for gestation. This is how they try to trick you guys. They will give you answer choices where part of the answer is correct and everything else is wrong. Remember what I taught you. If one thing is wrong in the answer choice, the whole thing is wrong. Throw it out. Okay? Look how beautiful C is. They gave you a beautiful answer in the beginning, preterm birth. But everything else after that is wrong. Throw it out. Look at D, growth retardation. Okay, yes, women who smoke, their babies um, often have uh, growth retardation. That's correct. But look at this. It says growth retardation in weight and length. You see what they did there? Mothers who smoke, their babies tend to have growth retardation in weight. That's why they have, what, the low birth weights, but not length. You see that one word in that answer made the whole thing wrong. And guys, as students, you guys tend to struggle with this because you see an answer and it's so beautiful and you want to choose it. But you see one thing wrong and you're like, oh, well, it's just one thing. No, guys. That one thing made the whole thing wrong. Okay? That one thing made the whole thing wrong. You're better off choosing that better, the second best answer. Okay? And this is why your correct answer is low birth weight. Why? Because everything in low birth weight is correct. The physician has ordered an injection of Rogam for the postpartum client whose blood type is A negative, but whose baby is O positive. To provide postpartum prophylaxis, Rogam should be administered A, within 72 hours of delivery, B, within one week of delivery, C, within two weeks of delivery, or D, within one month of delivery. And the correct answer is A, within 72 hours of delivery. So let me explain this to you because many students, you guys, I don't know why you struggle with this. So I want you to understand this. If mom is negative, if she's negative, she's going to get the Rogam. Just put that in your head. Why? Because if she gets pregnant from a male that's positive, okay? Mom's negative. Now she's got a positive in her womb. If it's the first pregnancy, the baby's okay because mom didn't develop antibodies, right? But right after, you know, she gives birth, mom develops these antibodies. So next time she gets pregnant again, and it's a positive baby, positive baby, a positive um, blood type, it's positive. Guess what? Her body will see the baby as a foreign invader, as an enemy, and her body will attack the baby. Now, here's the problem. And here's why if mom's negative, she's going to get real gam regardless. Sometimes women get pregnant and they didn't even know they were pregnant. They had no idea they were pregnant. Then they have a miscarriage and they think, whoa, I had two periods in one month. What happened? Or they'll say, whoa, this was a very big um, um, cycle. And they don't realize that they miscarried that baby. And that baby was positive. So here you have a mom that's negative and her body developed these antibodies. Then later down the road, she has a baby and this baby's positive and her body's attacking the baby. That's why we don't take a chance. Sometimes mom has her husband right there with her. And you ask, you say, have you ever been pregnant before? And she says, no. She says, no, because her husband's right there, right? But when she was in college, she got pregnant and she had abortion and she didn't tell anybody. And that baby that was in her stomach was a positive baby. Now she has antibodies. So she's lying because she doesn't want her husband to know. But 
you could put that baby at risk. So that's why we don't play with that. If mom's negative, she gets Rogam and you just need to put that in your head. The minute you see the question and it says that mom is negative, you know she's getting Rogam and she's getting Rogam immediately after she gives birth within 72 hours. Okay. All right, guys, we have one more question. A newborn with narcotic abstinence syndrome is admitted to the nursery. Nursing care of the newborn should include A, teaching the mother to provide tactile stimulation, B, wrapping the newborn snugly in a blanket, C, placing the newborn in the infant seat, or D, initiating an early infant stimulation program. And I'll give you a moment to think of your answer. So the correct answer is B, wrapping the newborn snugly in a blanket. Why? Okay. When uh, this happens, the baby's going through what? Withdrawal. Okay, so when you wrap them snugly in the blanket, what does um, it prevent? Muscle irritability, okay? So you want to wrap them snugly in the blanket and you want them to be in a quiet, calm environment. You don't want any stimulation at all. That's why you're wrapping them because you don't want, you want them like this. You don't want muscle irritability. You don't want muscle contraction. You want them in, not, in a nice, quiet environment so you see a teaching them to provide tactile stimulation no you're going to decrease stimulation as much as possible look at choice c putting them in infancy to go where you're moving around absolutely not why we want to decrease stimulation choice d initiate initiating an early infant stimulation program what did i just tell you no, we want a quiet environment, decreased stimulation. Guys, my time is up because I hit my 30-minute mark. Um, I hope these questions were helpful. I've seen lots of comments of uh, other concepts that you guys want to see. And these are great ideas. I didn't even think of them. So I, they'll be coming soon. I saw legal and excuse me, I just popped my I saw legal and ethics. I saw um culture so i'll definitely be uh, making some of those videos for you they're coming soon guys again please share my videos if you have any friends any nursing students anybody studying for the boards please share my videos tell them to make sure they come on and they do what like and subscribe thank you so much for sharing this time with me and i'll see you next time